All right, here we are. <laughs> First time I do this. I need to turn the volume. First time I do this. All right, well, we eliminate the echo here. All right, and so I have a tablet next to me also, so I'll be able to see the chat. So hopefully my massive disability technology won't be won't be a hindrance. So let's see how this goes. So one of the things that um, last week we reached 100,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel. And so I asked a bunch of people on social media what they would like. One of the, the biggest answer was to have my brother back on the channel, which I would absolutely love. But uh, I don't think I don't think it's going to happen. The other thing that came on a lot was a commentary on Revelation, which I am starting. I've done already done one video. We'll do another video and then possibly a third video. Not sure yet. And uh, yet another thing that appeared was people saying they wanted to see a live uh, carving. And so I thought, OK, sure, I could do that. That's fine. So I've got a small carving that I need to do. And so um, and so let's do it. I don't know if I'll be able to finish the whole thing while I'm doing the live stream, but who knows? We'll see. We'll see how it goes. And so the small carving is the small carving of the Mother of God. And I'm doing it on a piece of uh, steatite, a piece of soapstone you can see here. Um, and so the, what, how I do it is this is a drawing that I did of, of the Mother of God that I use for this particular pattern. And uh, I just use a piece of carbon paper underneath because I need to trace the drawing on the stone. So I'm really starting you guys from the beginning, I guess. I could have started after I I could have started after making the drawing, but I was all excited about doing this cuz I had never done it before. So I'm going to try to take a look at the chat once in a while. There are no moderators as I know of unless someone unless like Brad or Lisa decide to hop in. Uh, when they noticed this. I didn't warn them that I was doing this. So there are no moderators, so it's possible that things will get a little loopy in the uh, comment section, in the chat. Sorry if that happens. Just ignore the, ignore the trolls. So one of the really interesting things that happened last week, I was kind of absent from uh, social media. I was supposed to go, I was supposed to go to Saskatoon to teach a carving class, and uh, because of COVID, it was just complicated. It was like semi legal for me to stay with them and everything. Everything was suspicious, so I decided not to go. And there are other reasons too, like uh, just at home, it was just better that I stay home, and so. And so they asked me if I could maybe carve, make a carving training, record it, and uh, send them the videos. And so I thought, okay, yeah, I could do that. That's not a problem. And I kind of know how fast I carve things, so I thought it could work. And um, and so I grossly misinter like I, I grossly mistook how much time it was going to take me. It took me like five times more than what I what I had planned on because of the editing, because I kept, I kept, uh, I kept having some technical problems with the camera and stuff and lighting and all the, oh, so many problems anyways. So I barely slept last week because I do spent all night editing these videos for carving and stuff. So what I want when I'm doing this tracing is I really just want the basic lines for myself. Um, if I was, if I was teaching a class, I would tell you to trace all the lines because it's good to get to know, get to know the image. But you know, I, I really, I know this image so well because I've carved it so many times. So that's all I'm going to put on there. So Jonathan Henry asks, how did you come up with the design for the drawing? 
And if you made it up from scratch, how do you decide what symbolism to add style to use? So the drawing is based on a traditional image. It's a, it's an image of the, of the mother of God supplicant. It would be, it would be an image that would be next to Christ. And so you can imagine her head, she's bowing and next to it here would be an image of Christ. And on the other side would be an image of St. John the Baptist, which is called a deusis. So three images together. And, uh, and so usually you see the whole image. I'll actually, I can show you because, wait, this was the, this is the carving I was working on for the training last week. And so you can see this is a full image of the, the type of image that would be in this deusis. So you can see St. John the Baptist with his arms out showing us Christ who would be in the middle and the mother of God on the other side. But now it's just the face of the mother of God. So the idea is I base my I base my drawing on on a traditional pattern, um, but obviously there is some there is some leeway to adjust it to what you want, you know, to emphasize different things, and to uh, especially if I'm carving. So if I'm carving, I need to uh, I need to adjust the. Uh, oh, I need to move this a little bit here going to be a little sketchy at the beginning because I I'm not I never done this before. All right. So in a carving there are certain things in a carving that are difficult to do that are not the same as a painting. Like there are some things in painting that you can't do in carving. So you need to make sure that your design is appropriate for carving. But this image is really just a basic image of of the mother of god which would be recognized by any Christ, orthodox christian that goes to church because it's the type of image which would be which would also be uh in a in the deusis on on the um on the iconostasis if someone has a big iconostasis this this type of image would be on the iconostasis so someone asked if i'm still taking commissions and the answer is I am not taking commissions at this time. Uh, my, right now, my, my waiting list is like two years. And, and uh, you know, it got really bad because of the flooding in my house because I was out of the workshop. It was just hard to, 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 to stay focused on, on the carving. Like I was still carving, but it was just really difficult to, to get a nice workflow. Um, but now, from, since, but during the time of the flood, I hired uh, an assistant who's helping me. Um, and so I'm hoping that that will really kind of speed things up. If you've, if you guys are following my Patreon carving project, I have a, so I have like two Patreon projects, one for the videos, one for carving. If you're following the carving one, you'll see his, his kind of work. We're designing uh, more ornamental stuff with him. Uh, he was a mosaicist before he started working for me. He's actually an old friend, uh, from college that I've known, you know, since I was like 17. And, uh, and so he's he's working on kind of ornamental designs with mosaics and uh, di using different patterns, which will then integrate into more elaborate carvings. And so I'm focusing on having some some more elaborate carvings. Like I'm really excited right now because because uh, Jordan Peterson ordered two like three very large uh, carvings, which he he said you know make them the best that you can, like the best that you've ever done. So I always like that because it gives me a lot of leeway to just go nuts. So we're going to integrate a lot of the stuff we're we're um, we're designing. But his commission, he's going to get in two years. Like I basically took his commission because I really, really wanted to do it because it was really elaborate. But all the other commissions, I'm not, sadly not taking right now. Hopefully, in a year or so, I'll open up commissions again. And. Uh, So what I need to do at first is I basically need to free up the space. So I'm taking out the, just outlining the shape and then taking out the background.
as you can see, this this turning this table that turns is a huge help. Someone asked, I hope the video is out uh, full in the channel. I will probably just leave it on the channel. Unless I say something horribly stupid, which I would be surprised that that would happen. So one of the actually exciting things is that, so this, um, this workshop that I did last week that I that I put together um, for these people in Saskatoon is basically like a full on online uh, recorded workshop with explanations and like three cameras where you can see the carving from two angles. You can hear me speak. So I'm I'm actually really considering pulling it, putting it out online uh, as like an as like an online course that I could that I could. Um, that I could sell, that people could could sign up for. So look out for that in the next, I don't know when, but uh, if I, hopefully I'll have time to get that ready. But I'd really like to do that because it's really annoying. There are a lot of really promising people that were taking my icon carving classes, but now with COVID, everything is just so so dead. Thunderwolf asks if Gadsad has taken up my conversation challenge. And the answer is no. Gadsad is, is ignoring my... I actually wrote him an email too and asked if he wanted to talk to me. Um, but I'm sure he must find me to be very strange. This strange Christian guy. And I'm, and I'm sure like he doesn't, he doesn't understand what relevance it would have to talk to me. Someone says, I bet you could have an epic jack-o'-lantern. Yeah, we, in, the, in the past few years, I've actually done that with the kids. Um, carved some pretty, uh, some pretty intense Halloween pumpkins. That's been fun. Not this year, though, for some reason. I think this year, because we were fixing up our house, and we, didn't, we just didn't have time. And because of COVID and everything, Halloween was almost canceled. Um, but usually, we take the time. I spend some time with my kids, and we spend like a half a day, you know, carving some epic pumpkins. Because my both of my daughters are quite artistic. Hopefully this is doesn't isn't like chalk on a like a fingernails on a on a chalkboard for you guys. Sorry. So it's a mix of so it's a mix of mallet and then using uh, just pushing with my hand to scrape because the mallet will leave some like ma massive uh, marks on there. But if I scrape it then, then I can remove the This dust is <laughs> is super toxic.
It's silica dust, so it, it just gets in your lungs and kills you. So I have to be more I have to be attentive to that. <laughs> it says having storytellers here makes me more sure about the theory that big movies follow Jonathan. Um, I mean, you guys probably know that I've done a few videos with Thomas from the Storyteller. Uh, there's a few videos that that were actually together on online. I did a video also with them for their channel um, on um, what was it on? It was on. Uh, get the name of that movie with the big uh, big robots. And uh, and also Thomas has edited a lot of my movie videos, and so so we 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 get along pretty well for the last few years. Pacific Rim, yes, of course. Man, I'm an idiot. Yeah, we did we did a video on Pacific Rim together. And I kept mispronouncing Jaegers. I kept saying Jaegers, I think. And then people would criticize me. I've been so out of movies. Like, I just don't watch movies anymore. Um, and uh, I think it's because I just can't... I, I'm just struggling with the with the stories now. You know, I've, I made a few videos criticizing them, but it's like, do I really want to subject myself to this all the time? And so I watched... Oh, you know, so everybody was telling me you need... I, like, there's like, what is WandaVision about, you know? You should watch WandaVision. You should watch WandaVision. What is it? Like, I'm trying to understand it. And so I did. I watched WandaVision, and my goodness... Like if you didn't think it was the end of the world yet, just watch WandaVision <laughs> and now and now you can be pretty sure that it's the end of the world. I wonder like watching WandaVision, I wonder if people made that to to give you sympathy for people who were like burning witches because seriously, that series like the ending I'm not going to spoil it for whoever wants to watch it, but the ending of that series is so insane. Like it is so insane that you wonder what exactly are they thinking? Someone asked if working alone, if I listen to music. Yes, I listen to, I listen to, I liked, I'd rather listen to podcasts. Um... I listen to podcasts and I also listen to books. And so I, I either I read books on Audible or I I actually have like an a reader, like an electronic reader that just reads me PDFs. And so often I'll read books. Um, I'll read books while I'm working. My mind is actually pretty available while I'm working. So Storyteller says, I'm at the finale. It's been confusing to say the least. Yeah, you're going to love the... F I mean, anyways, you can t I'd like to talk... It would be good to talk to you about it, Thomas, because I'm curious. I'd be curious to know what you think of it. To me, it was it's just like... It's basically... It's like WandaVision is basically uh, a defense of the Matrix is what I would call it. <laughs> That's what I would say. It's like, what if the Matrix was a good thing? Or at least justifiable, right? It's like, and I'm, we're not saying it's good, but we're saying there are reasons, you know. And and you know, you should understand the reasons. <laughs> so that's what I think. One of it is very disturbing. And also, but it's interesting, like the link between uh, between the idea of the occult and and um, and and uh, an artificial intelligence. You know, the idea that there's some like occult force preserving the artificial intelligence it's like really is that is that what you want us to, to is that the message you want to give us because we kind of think that already but you know we're not going to say it out loud most of the time
And so the first part of the carving is the boring part. It's it's actually not it's boring in the sense that it's just carving um carving the halo and carving the carving the background, but it's also good because it's uh it's a nice uh like it gets you ready for the carving because it's not as doesn't ask much of you except to just do it. I want the like I want all the background and this halo to be nice and clean like this. Calvin Sweetie asked if I reached out to Tim Mackey with the Bible Project. Yes, I did. I made that effort. I went and found the, the on their email. They have uh, on their website. They have an email for uh, press, like a. Uh, and so I went and wrote them an email, kind of explain what I'm doing, and asked them if Tim could come on the channel. But they told me that he is not doing interviews right now. That was the answer I got. So if, if anybody has an in to the Bible project or an in to God Sad, you need to convince them of how important it would be. <laughs> I'm really bad at inviting people to, to go on my channel. I've been pretty much just when people write me, I that's when I usually um Kind of have them on my channel after they've written me that's usually been most mostly been how it's happened or like some exchange on twitter some exchange on social media and then it kind of prompts me to to invite them but yeah i probably need to be a bit more a bit more aggressive about that One of the interesting things that might be happening, it's not 100% sure, but uh, I might I might participate in um, with uh, Unbelievable, that show, that British show that kind of kind of pits believers and atheists against each other. And so that'd be cool if that could happen. That'd be nice. So someone asks, is there a ritual prayer that you say while carving? Uh, no, I usually usually I I do my morning prayers and uh you know and do the Jesus prayer for a while and then I I come to the workshop. You know, that's usually the way I do it. I don't necessarily I think that ideally I could probably do the Jesus prayer while I'm carving, but it's just not a discipline that I've developed. I kind of see my carving time as a as a time to learn stuff and to read, and so
So I'm basically going over the lines and the lines, I mean, the importance of the lines is that every line basically is like a change of level. And so I need to, to remove some stone so that I can then create that difference in levels that will be there. Someone asked, what are my thoughts on the dietary restrictions in the Old Testament? Um, and I think that they're interesting in terms of understanding symbolism. They help you understand the relationship between pure and impure, and they can help you understand um, quite a few things, actually. But I don't, Christians don't practice those. Um, Christians have different restrictions, which are li linked to fasting and not eating uh, meat itself. And so you can understand the not eating meat rather rather than like just the idea of uh, pure or impure animals. You can understand the not eating meat rather as this momentary return to the garden because in the Garden of Eden, uh, they didn't eat uh, meat. And so you, and so monks actually in the Orthodox tradition don't eat meat in theory. I mean, obviously... I'm sure some do, but in theory, they're not supposed to eat it. And so right now is Lent. And so during Lent, uh, Christ Orthodox Christians don't eat any animal products in theory. Um, and so no, no, no eggs, no... No animal fat, you know, none of that, and um, no fish. But it depends. I mean, obviously, people have different, different, different strictures, and some people have health issues that will affect, or not just health issues, but sometimes also kind of social issues will make it very difficult to fast because the the purpose of the fast is not just to, it's not just like to to practice the rules, right? But it's it's mostly to learn to to abstain. Um, and then to kind of watch yourself, <laughs> to watch yourself and realize just how much you are a slave of your, of your passions, how much you are, you justify your own behavior. And so, you know, failing during Lent is, is sometimes good to help you see that you're, that you're not in control of your own, you're not totally in control of your own self. So someone asks, uh, you know, you lost the tradition of fasting, any advice? Um, I mean, the early Christians used to used to fast twice a week on Wednesdays and Fridays, which is a tradition which is still there. Um, and th like I said, it, 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 there are different ways to do it depending on your situation. For example, like if you can't fast from meat for some reason, you know, like it's just not possible in your context or whatever it is, then you can, you can sometimes just do a meal a day in the evening. Um, so, so that's a way to fast as well. Sometimes, sometimes people do both. Like some, some people will do just vegetables and one meal a day. And in theory, like in theory, for example, you're not even in the, uh, during Lent, you're not supposed to eat oil. Like, you're supposed to have veg vegetables without oil. And so, like, I can't, like, I can't do that. It's just too hard in my situation. So, and so I don't do that. So everybody has kind of their thing. And it's good to to just be aware of it. And if you have a spiritual father, to kind of discuss it with your spiritual father.
When someone says, when you're done, please put a, a list of starter tools in the description. The problem with this is that even if I put a list of starter tools, all these tools are, most of these tools I made. And so it's like, you know, this is a, this is actually a punching tool, which I gr grind down because it has high, high carbon steel. So I just grind it down to make it the shape I want. Like if you look at this tool, for example, this is just a wood chis a wood, uh, um, I guess not called it uh, a chisel. Yeah, I get a I guess a wood chisel. It's a flat one, and and then I round it off, like I round off the top a little bit, just because it to make it do what I want it to do. So, so it's tough. Like this is a wood. This is actually just a wood carving tool. It's like a fell, a fell uh, wood carving tool that works really well for small spots. So it's hard to write down like what what you need because most of my tools for stone at least I've made or kind of grab from here and there. Wood carving tools are more standard. That's why like when I teach, for example, like the carving class I did online that I'm going to put out there is probably going to be, it's, it's good. It's a wood, wood class because it's, it's just more simple and it's, you can get all the material very easily. Like this stone, even if, even if I gave you the tools too, I, I don't know where you would get the stone. Like I import this stone from Kenya um, and so you need to get something analogous, which I'm not sure where you would get. Because this is a kind of soapstone, a steatite, but it's not a, it's, it's a, it's pretty dense. It's not as, as uh, porous and as soft as the soapstone, for example, that I could get here in Canada. Um, like Inuit, Inuit, um, so like native communities here up north, you know, a, a kind of Eskimo I guess you would call them. They carve uh, soapstone, but the soapstone they carve is very different. It's like this dark green soapstone. I often feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world because I get to think about things and make and make YouTube videos and write about more, let's say, high or abstract ideas. And then I get to like come into my workshop and just bang at a piece of stone with a mallet for a few hours. So it's a nice, uh, it's a nice balance. That's what it feels like sometimes. I want to create these three, these three fold, these three steps. You can see there are three folds here in her homophorion, her, her veil, and then three steps on this side. And so that's kind of what I'm working. That's what I'm trying to create.
Someone says, I was able to attend my first OCA liturgy. Just excited to share it with you. That's awesome. Daniel DeMarco. Is that right? So where are where are you, Daniel? Where like what what state are you attending liturgy in? Hey, Alistair Roberts is there. That's awesome. Nice to see you, Alistair. I wanna I wanna have you back on my channel, by the way. I keep thinking that I should write you. And that we should have another discussion, and then I, then I just, then I just forget because I'm like that. But if you'd like, I would really, it would be really cool to have you back on the channel. So Daniel DeMarco says North, Northern New, New Jersey. Nice. Well, it's good to know you can go. Like we just. Until until two days ago, we had an eight o'clock curfew and we could only be 10 people in church. And so because of that, we would have to like trade off. We would you, know, you would sign up on a list and they would prioritize people that weren't there the week before that, you know, that hadn't gone yet. And so it's been kind of hit and miss. I've been going to church every two weeks pretty much. But um, so they just changed that um, a few days ago. And so now it's 100 people, which means that. For us, at least my church, it's pretty much going to be open now for everybody. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. I'm probably probably going to be able to go to uh, Annunciation this week. <clears throat> so Greg Holm asks, do you do printmaking? As well, or just carving? No, I don't do printmaking. I mean, I'm doing some drawings. I'm thinking about doing printmaking. That's definitely something that I'm considering, just because it's like right now I have, I guess I have the problem that the demand for what I'm doing is too high and I can't, um, I can't uh, make enough things. And I also don't want to raise my prices too much because I'm making sacred art. Like, I'm, it's not like I'm making secular art. So, I need to be careful, and so I thought maybe if I did printmaking, I could have things that are still reasonably priced, but I could make I could make more. Well, um, sorry, I feel like it's not the best view of this. What if I first time technical? I feel like I could give you guys a better view of this. Maybe if I did this, so that I think that's closer. Yeah, I think it's better. All right, I think it's better. All right, so the tricky thing with these with this carving, I'm gonna tell you the little secret of this carving, is that her fold, her her um, her veil folds. So when it folds, it goes it goes around and back. So this is always the tricky thing. So when I'm teaching carving to people, 
This is where everybody gets confused because you have to show that the veil is on is on this side here and then it goes underneath there. Um, so, but it's actually some of the fun part it's, to me, at least, is creating those relationships. So Z asks me what I think of Tarkovsky's Rublev. Uh, yeah, I mean, Tarkovsky is amazing. And I think for sure he's definitely worth spending time with. You know, if he's definitely for people who want to kind of understand how to create uh, or to bring about some of the questions, you know, that about the Christian ethos in movies. In a deeper way, like not just a, not not a superficial, you know, propagandistic way. But I think that Tchaikovsky, for sure, I don't even know if he was a Christian, but he definitely was imbibed with a lot of, um, or he is, he's not dead, is he? I don't even know. <laughs> that he's imbibed with kind of orthodox ethos, so. Someone asked if, if I have something to propose to learn about orthodoxy, a basic thing. I mean, I always propose uh, there's a book called The Orthodox Way by Metropolitan uh, Callistos Ware. So it's called The Orthodox Way. And it's a very, it's a book written for Westerners. And so it's written to kind of help people understand what, um, what the spiritual life is and what the vision of the spiritual life in orthodoxy is. It's, it's very easily accessible. So someone asked if I listened to music. I guess I didn't answer that properly the other day. Yeah, not the other day, like just before. I I listen to I listen mostly to podcasts and books, but once in a while I listen to music. I used to listen to a lot more music, but I would say in the past, like seven seven years maybe i've i don't listen to a lot of music anymore like whatever time i had to listen i listen to um to uh, content but if i like when i'm sleepy let's say during the day if i'm tired and i'm trying to carve but i'm, I'm just kind of not being able to focus and uh i feel kind of drained then i'll listen to music someone asked if i listen to and then they ask if i listen to uh Dirt Poor Robin's uh, music, and yes, I do listen to Dirt Poor Robin's music. I'm, a, I'm actually enjoying it quite a bit these days. Like in the car and stuff, I'll put it on. Storytellers asked what I think of Terrence, Terrence Malick and his and uh, and his last movie, Hidden Life. I haven't watched it because the thing is, the Terrence Malick movies, I really struggle with them. But so many people have told me about a Hidden Life that I probably should watch it. But it's like, what was that other one with the dinosaurs? Um, I really struggled with that movie. Um, I feel like there's, at least the ones I've watched, I feel like there's a lot of meandering. But I should I should probably watch A Hidden Life. Like I said, I really don't watch a lot of movies. And it's weird because when I do, it's I'd rather watch like a stupid, uh, like a big stupid movie um, with my kids. Because my kids, I usually now watch, most of the stuff I watch, I watch with my kids. Because it's it's kind of like also a time to just kind of hang out with them. So someone asked if I saw Silence by Martin Scorsese. Yes, I did. 
An interesting story. I actually watched Silence by Martin Scorsese for the first time uh, at a retreat uh, for Orthodox priests. They invited me to come do like to be like the speaker at their retreat. And one of the things they wanted to do was to like watch a movie and then have me interpret it. And I'd never seen Silence, so I watched it with them. Um, and I have to say, it was a very disturbing movie. I find it very disturbing. Movies like that, they're disturbing because they actually... It's like you'd almost would rather people not make movies about Christian subjects if they're going to be weird about it. It's almost, I'd rather they didn't. Because when they do, then it, it comes close to something, you know? For example, like they're trying to come close to the idea of of self sacrifice and of and the idea of uh, let's say the love of others, but they 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 have this weird then they they present this weird thing where it's it's the almost the idea that if you love others then you will deny Christ out of your love for others, and it's like ah no, you know what? Sorry, that's not this doesn't work. It's just I just I'm not getting on board in your with your little moral dilemma that you're trying to present to me here, uh, and this idea that like Christ would would want would want someone to deny him, uh, just very 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 disturbing. Um, so I didn't I didn't particularly like that. Sorry if I ruined the movie for you guys. I'm like. I, never ask me about never ask me like uh about uh about movies because i i really don't care about the spoilers thing like i i, I often don't care about being spoiled on a movie myself because that's not why i watch movies or why i mean what i why i would spend time on it and so and so sorry if i spoiled the movie for you guys Yeah, someone says they highly recommend the island. Yeah, the island is very good. I really, really like that. Someone asked me, who are my favorite historic iconographers? You know, it's funny that you ask that because I really don't have, I don't have that vision of iconography. So it's like if I, because for example, like an icon carving, the, the, the iconographers aren't known. So you could say that like, let's say my favorite, uh, my favorite, iconographers are whoever it is that carved those um those like 9th 10th century ivories that were done in the byzantine court after the icon after iconoclasm uh it's like those i feel like those carvings i base a lot of my work on whatever was developed in those carvings and so I, that's pretty much how i see it you know and so but i mean let's say I really like, I really like, uh, let's say, Pancelinos because he has, he kind of has uh, volume to his work. Um, and so it's interesting to think about it in terms of carving for myself. And so, of course, I love Rublev's icons and I love that period of, of uh, Russian iconography as well. But I also really love Western medieval art. And so, you know, there's some, like, for example, the, if you think of the, um, a lot of my work is, is also kind of based on what I guess you could call the kind of 10th century, uh, 12th century Byzantine Norman uh, synthesis. I don't know how else you could call it. Like whatever, whatever, whatever kind of movement created the, the great, uh, 
the great churches in Sicily, um, those that moment I think is a really kind of crucial moment. Um, and so a lot of my work is based on that, and it's it's something it's a very there's a universal aspect to that that style that got developed at that time. So one of the things that, one of my contentions, I would say, is that although we live in a time of mixture and a time of confusion, you would say, there's also an opportunity in that moment, which is that whatever it is that gives us the mixture and the, the, uh, the confusion, uh, there's something in that which, which can also bring about a kind of synthesis. You know, so if you think about the problem of iconography right now is that it's not, I mean, the problem, the reality of iconography is that in every other period of time in the history of the, of iconography, people would learn from some master and would, would maybe travel with them and then see churches that were done and then would, would have sketchbooks with the different, um, the different subjects inside. And so that's how they would learn. And so, like the way we learn is we have access to all the very best icons still available online and we can flip through them like we flip through a catalog. And so that has a massive effect on our psyche and the way we read art and the way we understand the tradition. And so and so it, there's something that's nefarious about that, of having access to all the very best icons and uh, at your fingertips. But there's also something... Uh, like in the juxtaposition, there's also something which is kind of weird and and uh, hybrid about it. But I think that in that, there's also the possibility of having some distance, of kind of looking at things from a distance, which is alienating, but can also which but can also bring about a kind of synthesis. And so that's kind of the um, the vision that I have for what I'm doing, and also kind of the vision I have for the best like. The, the vision I have of the best iconographers that are working today, which is to create a synthetic icon iconographic style and iconographic language, you could say. Um, so it doesn't mean that it's it doesn't mean that we, it's all going to be the same. It's actually, there will be there's difference in there, but. Um, That's been my approach, at least. So there's an ask, like, for example, like in my carving, there's an aspect of my carving. Uh, let's say the way I make faces, which is which is actually probably more akin to something which is more hieratic or more uh, schematized, you would say. Something you could find maybe in like Western medieval art or maybe uh, a hint of, of Coptic or kind of Syrian iconography in the sense of a, a kind of simpler, less less um, idiosyncratic aspect in the face. Um, and so it, I think it has something to do with stone itself. Like th that's that the material also lends itself to that kind of interpretation. So someone asked, what can you say about geometric patterns uh, as constituting art as you see in Islamic art? I really love geometric patterns. I, I'm not good at them in, in the sense that they require a certain mindset, which I don't think I really have. Uh, like, and I, you know, there's a lot of Islamic art, which is very beautiful and very, very impressive. And so... To ask that is is is, a, is an interesting idea. So, for example, like the idea, if anybody would say that they have a problem with that, you know, it, it would be extremely problematic because the, for example, the 
in most traditional Orthodox churches that would have been in the Mediterranean, the the uh, the rugs on the floor would probably have come from Islamic countries um, because of that beautiful ornamental uh, capacity that they had, you know, in terms of geometry and in terms of repetitive patterns. And so I have no problem with that at all. In fact, I think that it's interesting to to take some uh, like an Islamic manuscript, for example, like to take some of that ornamentation and um, to use it in my in my designs or in the designs that I'm working with my assistant on. Like we there there's always a discussion, you know. There's an idea that people have in terms of let's say the medieval world as this kind of isolated world where nobody was in contact with anybody, but that is not the case. There was always a discussion you know, uh, between, between these different cultures and styles. And, uh, and so there was definitely different influences going around. So there's definitely an influence on, let's say the, between Byzantine art and, and Persian miniature, you know, between, uh, Byzantine art to Persian miniature to Mughal Indian miniature to, so there's all these like relationships that create themselves. You know, so Hagia Sophia, the pattern of the cross, the dome and the cross or the dome and the square was really perfected in, in, in Christianity with Justinian and then became the model for pretty much all of Islamic architecture, you know. And so uh, Islamic architecture is really like a dome on a square or a dome on an octagon. And then coming back the other way, then the, all of the a lot of the ornamentation, the the very powerful geometric work that was done by Islamic artists, then kind of flooded back into Western miniature and then also uh, Byzantine miniature as well. So I have some tools that I've rounded out more. You guys want to see. These are really mo more round. And so if I want to create uh, some, like a dip. So one of the tricks, one of the tricks of low relief carving is that you want to, you want to use as little space as possible to, to nonetheless give a sense of the form. So a way to do it sometimes is to create these little bowls with an edge on each side. And then that edge on each side will will emphasize the light more. Will kind of make the, the the form pop out. Someone asks, com common sense culture asks if for projects like this, I often have to start over. And how has that changed since you started? Um, to be honest, I almost never have to start over. When I started, I made a few mistakes right at the beginning, like in the very first year. Um, but they weren't in the carving. They were actually like, I, for example, like twice. This is just insane. It shows how... Uh, 
I was making uh, I was making a cross for a priest, and it was a cross that was supposed to go into a wooden frame. And at first, I thought, you know, if I make the fit nice and uh, like nice and tight, it'll look really good because it'll just kind of tightly go in there. And so I made the frame, and I would carve out the the frame, and then insert the cross inside. And so twice I made the frame too tight, and then when I pushed the cross in, it just it broke after I had carved the whole thing. Um, and so I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I don't make that mistake anymore. Uh, and the other times where I've made like massive mistakes have been uh, like sometimes with these these stone carvings when they're big, I'll remove the background with a router. And so sometimes like uh, the router bit was like too loose or something. And uh, and then when I'm taking out the background, it would like dig in way too much. So those are the kind of mistakes that I made. But the thing with carving is that if if you're careful, you can always fix your mistakes. It takes it takes work because you kind of have to carve the whole thing down around it. But it's actually quite forgiving. So I really I really panic. As you can see, like when I get to the little details, when I get to the end, I'm not carving with a mallet anymore. I carve with the mallet at the beginning to do the, the basic forms and the, the levels. But then when I get to um, when I get to the finishing of, of the the form, then I use a knife. So someone asks, can anyone make icons? And to be honest, I think that I think that anybody can, let's say, approach iconography in terms of learning about it, uh, about you know learning to uh, to make to, to learning the process, uh, and even maybe learning to make icons. I don't think that it's necessarily restricted. But in order to, if you want to make icons for the church, if you want to make icons. Uh, that that you that will be used in the church and that will be used for that people will venerate then i would i would really suggest that you have the permission of your of your bishop or at least of your priest or of your spiritual father um just because it's very important and and uh there are certain there are certain rules like there are there are just certain things you have to know and that you have to be careful about and so it's not like it's not a willy-nilly thing like you can't just go you can't just do whatever you want and so i mean and sometimes i have very let's say um well-intentioned people who send me things that they want me to comment on and and they look nice in the sense that they're technically proficient but they they're lacking in the language they're lacking in the kind of the the unsaid language of what makes an icon an icon um and and that's a difficult discussion right in, in iconography because obviously it's all about patterns and understanding and interpreting what is essential and what is a detail in terms of what the what have been, has been given to us by the by our, those before us and so that's a discussion that's live in iconography right now where some iconographers tend to want to copy directly like not just copy but Let's say, like even the, the the drawing I did for this, for some iconographers, this would be this would be like a faux pas. I, I should trace a pattern that's that that already exists, like not draw my own. Um, whereas others will go the totally opposite route, which is to be extremely flexible about what's possible and what's not possible, and and to kind of want to have the their own personal style and all that stuff. Uh, so the discussion is quite is quite live right now in the world of iconography. So someone asked how much these little icons are. These little icons are three hundred dollars, but I'm not. I don't like. This is actually a commission. For a while, what I was doing is I knew that. 
Because if you order like a bigger thing that has a lot of detail, then it ends up being expensive. And I knew that not everybody could afford it. And I also knew that a lot of people, um, they don't, they don't, they can't necessarily wait for a very long time. And so for a while I was making, regularly making these little carvings and then putting them for sale on social media. But it's like, once you, once you realize that you've got two years waiting list, it's, it's, Hard to justify making these carvings also. So right now what I'm doing for people who want kind of more inexpensive carvings for me, I encourage them to uh, to be involved in the in the Patreon project because I'm uh, what we do is we we develop these uh, these these ornamental carvings and these kind of semi figurative carvings with angels and uh, different animals and stuff, and uh, and then every we're, what we're going to do we've done it already once is that every once in a while, like a few times a year, we're going to just sell them. And uh, those who are supporting the Patreon project will have have first dibs. Uh, obviously, there are people giving at high level that will get an actual carving, so we save carvings for them. But then, but then others will get like first dibs, and then after that, then I put it on social media, and then people can, can buy the other ones. So Jonathan and yes, Jonathan as a father, as an artist, how do you use sacred art and the spiritual development catechesis of your kids as they've grown? Um, and so, I mean, obviously, I've always tried, like, let's say there was a feast or a, a Bible story when we, let's say we're, we're reading a Bible story or we were coming back from liturgy and it was a certain uh, gospel reading or a certain feast or whatever, I'd always try to point out the icon with the kids and kind of ask them to look at it, to tell me what they see, to kind of try to analyze the elements in the icon. Um, but my kids are not interesting in drawing icons, at least not yet. Maybe one day, who knows? But, you know, in terms of then just being a dad, then I, I definitely have given my kids uh, drawing classes. Um, and uh, and so we, we've done proportions and, you know, drawing from uh, observation different different uh different ways of teaching drawing my 13 year old daughter is basically like obsessed with anime now and that's all she 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 cares to draw or to or to be involved with it's kind of a little disturbing but you know i i can't i was when i was 13 i was like obsessed with batman or whatever or like you know, comic books so i can't totally can't totally blame her So Deluxe says he has a Twitch channel where he, he streams fish tanks. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm not very good at the whole streaming thing. I'm really not good technically for carving, for, for, for the YouTube stuff. So I should, I probably could actually use some help in figuring out how to do this i don't know like what you guys think how many people are watching like 382 that's actually not bad so maybe it's something i could do more often i don't know what you guys think it's for me obviously it's, if i'm carving it's not a big deal i can just can just uh have the camera running and then talk to you guys while i'm carving feel less less lonely <laughs> yeah right <laughs> i never feel lonely when i'm carving Thomas from Storyteller says one more Batman video. I know I've made way too many Batman videos. And I know that I've made way too many Batman videos because the last one I did, like 
not a lot of people watch it. I think they're like, what? Really? Or is it, are they, maybe they even think that, wait, I saw this before, just another Batman video. Uh, but no, my Batman videos, everybody should watch them because, because I deal with important issues. <laughs> All right, so now we're moving in the face, so we're coming into interesting thing. So she's wearing she the mother of god has two veils on. She has a major she has a veil on over her her head that is what you see and then underneath she has a she has like someone said it's called a snood which I don't like that word so I don't know if that's really what it's called. If someone knows what it's called, it's like a veil, it's just a covering over the hair. So she has this one covering over her hair and then on top she has like a veil. So you never actually see Mary's hair. You never see the mother of God of God's hair in in orthodox icons. gonna do the shoulder first hey Mahat Mahasattva is there amazing work thanks for the great content it's good to see you here so Mahasattva if you you probably you guys may have seen him on Twitter on Instagram he is uh, he's known for his his Kanye West paintings so he's actually given a painting to uh one of his paintings to uh, Kanye, and Kanye follows him on Twitter, which everybody is, is jealous about. So, uh, yeah, it's good to see you. Someone asked, do Byzantine Catholics have different styles than Eastern Orthodox? And so that's a very complicated question because it, it, it's, there's a historical situation which happened and it, didn't, it did happen through Byzantine Catholics before it happened in, uh, in the Orthodox world, which is that in the 18th, 19th century, I would say maybe starting a little bit before the the style of iconography became very western in Greece and in Russia as well so in the Slavic countries and so the so the traditional let's say practice and style of iconography almost vanished it was almost gone and um, and interestingly enough then at the, it also led to a kind of breakdown of of, ic of icons themselves, right? And so kind of moving into secularism, the, the, the idea of the icon or the importance of the icon started to disappear as well. And so there were always some practicers, but pr people practicing the traditional style or the ancient style, but they were few. And, uh, and it's in the 20th century, actually, that, uh, that the style, the ancient style of icon painting was restored through people like uh, Leonid Uspensky and Fotios Kontoglu in, in Greece, who kind of rediscovered the ancient style and then tried to help people understand it. You know, it's one of those things, sometimes I talk about um, how, you know, a few decades ago, 
people wouldn't even have understood what I was talking about. And I, I really do believe that because there was like a weird materialist blindness. And so I think that it's the same with, with icons. I think that there came a strange blindness where people really did think that, you know, representing uh, reality in a, in, in a certain manner was was the only way that you could represent it or was the the only possible reason why you would represent it. And they didn't have the capacity just because of a weird kind of philosophical, historical blindness to understand the value of more symbolic manners of representation. And and so in the 20th century, with the, actually the, the kind of post-World War II beginning of the breakdown, I guess you could call it, of modernism, um, that's when the possibility of seeing traditional icons again started to reappear. Um, and so so there were really some pioneers, and they made mistakes, I would say. They made mistakes in their theory, and they made mistakes in their, in their practice. And they're actually being, they're actually quite under attack right now in the world of iconography. And so there's a whole group of scholars and iconographers that are attacking the, uh, the, the, say the pioneers of, of, uh, of the modern icon movement. But, um, but I think despite their mistakes, I think what they offered us was really invaluable in terms of a capacity to see that was lost. And uh, so I definitely support the traditional style. But it, it, led, it did lead to some excesses. For example, like some people would say things like, you know, if an image is painted in a, in a Western style or in like a kind of post-Renaissance style, then it's not an icon. And I think that's really a dangerous route to go because you know i i would say it, it you have to see it in terms of hierarchy rather than see it as an on off switch and i i think it's dangerous to uh to decide what 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 really will be an, an icon in terms of how it affects the world you so you can accept that for example uh, like a really western painted icon can can still be a center of veneration and can still be a place where people encounter, you know, the, a mystery while, while saying that you think that traditional icons are superior theologically and that they should, that they should uh, be promoted and, and uh, be preferred, let's say, to the ancient style. I need to do. I need to put this in the middle. I think because I, I think because the image is not in the middle. When I turn it, keeps like it, it turns up and down. Is it better. Yeah, this is better. Sorry. This will be this will be easier to watch now because I didn't realize that because I I hadn't put it in the middle of the board it it was like spinning up and down for you guys. So someone says stopping homeschool to watch this. Come on, this is homeschool. This isn't stopping homeschool. <laughs> So the idea is, is because the nose is the is the highest point on the face, and I always free that up first.
make to make sure that that's on the highest point in the carving as well. It can be equal to other points, but it, it, it definitely has to be one of the highest points. Anders Rostad says, what do you think about flow state? Any symbolic insight? Um, I mean, I don't, have a, I, I don't have a problem with the idea of a flow state. I think one of the things I'm worried about when people talk about flow state is that, is, is that they somehow want to say that that's the mystical experience or that the, the, this kind of integrated moment that you have that that's the mystical experience and i think that that's a little dangerous because i think that maybe it's it's like a lot of things it, it can be a kind of can kindle your your interest or it can kindle your sense that there's something more or that there's a possibility of having higher states or higher experiences but I don't think that when you read what the the mystics go through, it's like that's 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 not that's not it doesn't limit itself to that. That's for sure. Like they the the states that they reach are much higher and and much you know. So I think that it's it's great you know when you're when you're praying or you know even carving. Sometimes I I definitely do reach a kind of flow state when I'm carving. Um, start to see the face now up here <laughs> so it says jns77 says i'm pretty sure you can enter into a flow state when you're, while you're killing people in the battlefield it may be transcendent but it might not necessarily be good for you that's an awesome point yeah yeah I'm, actually I'm, I'm pretty sure that many warrior cultures saw uh, killing people or just this, this state, like let's say the kind of this, this transpersonal state that you could reach during battle to be like a, a mystical thing. That's for sure. Like the whole idea of the berserker and, and you know, the idea that the berserker kind of loses himself and becomes a, uh, a vehicle. And also one of the, like, let's say one of the really important aspects of Christian or Orthodox spirituality is that you're not supposed to pay attention to the states. Like you're not supposed to pay, you're not supposed to attend to the spiritual states that you reach. You're actually supposed to be suspicious of them and to not, to not dwell on them. So it's not like you can't reach them. It's not that you don't, things won't happen to you and you won't reach these kind of ecstatic states, but, but uh, you should definitely, definitely shouldn't like search for them search out for them and you definitely shouldn't um, 
attend to them because you're going higher. Like you're reaching for, for the, the last, for the ultimate one, which is theosis, which is illumination, seeing the, seeing the divine light. Someone asks, Charlie Longoria asks, what carving skill was the most difficult for you to master? Um, hmm. I would say it's always, clothing is always the hardest. Clothing is really, it's like having the right level of subtlety in clothing because it, it's not just about carving it's about drawing and about understanding form and about um and so you, it's like you can always be a better you can always be better at clothing when you're you're an iconographer i think for painting it's probably the same uh and so i think that that's the that's always my challenge is is to try to to, to keep when i sometimes i look at some of the carvings i did in the past and I'm like, wow, I really, man, that clothing is really nice. And for some reason I can't reach that anymore. Um, but the other elements, I feel like they're more available to me, like the face and, um, you know, let's say carving the hands or carving different other aspects. One of the things that I've actually recently learned or recently acquired uh, in terms of carving, I would say it's been about a year, maybe a year and a half is I used to sand all my carvings like a lot. And so I would, I would carve, especially in stone, like I would carve the whole thing. And then with like sandpaper, I would like go over every single edge to make it smooth and everything. And I remember it was Andrew Gould, who's a, for those who don't know, he's a, he's a building designer who designs churches. He kept telling me, why do you sand your carving so much? He said, just carve it, like don't sand it. And and at first I was, I didn't want to do that because you can also fix things with sanding, you know, when you feel a little uneasy. But most recently in the past, I would say about a year, a little, maybe a little more, I've actually stopped sanding most of the carving. And so all the clothing I leave and um, the hands, these different parts, and I'll sand maybe sometimes just the surface of the face especially if it's a, if it's a woman to kind of make it smooth. But, uh, but all the rest I leave like the rocks in the background, the cities and everything. I don't sand. I just carve straight up and don't, uh, don't touch it. And it looks better. And, uh, so it both looks better and saves time, which is, which, Hey, you can't complain. You can't complain when something does that. So I'm actually right now, someone's talking about this soapstone that I'm carving from Kenya. It's called Kisi stone. Uh, and it's from the, it's from the Kisi area in, uh, in uh, Kenya, mostly from a, a town called Tabaka and around that town named Tabaka. And uh, I, one of the reasons I discovered this stone is because I lived there for several months with my wife and kids when we were living in Kenya. And uh, that's where I learned to carve this stone. And so I was taught to, uh, to, uh, to, to carve this. And then when I got back from Kenya, I really kind of threw myself into, into it. And I'm actually right now um, ordering a, a shipment of stones. 
So I'm just hoping there won't be like problems with COVID and whatever. But for now, it seems like it's 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 going. So is it me or are there more people in the in the live stream now than there are when we do the Q&A? Which is surprising, interesting. It might be because it's during the day as well. I'm thinking maybe that's what it is. Or maybe I should just should just I just should do these instead of instead of the Q&As. <laughs> be less exhausting, man. Those Q&As sometimes when I finish. I have like a mix of like exhaustion and exhilaration and so i'm super tired after the q a's but then i can't go to bed i can't sleep because i i have like a weird mental rush It says do the q a while carving <laughs> that's a, that i don't know if i could i don't know if i could manage it because i mean i don't think i could i would probably make a mistake in the carving because some of the questions you guys ask me during the q a's are like they're 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 tough questions and sometimes the kind of question that i have to be careful when i answer not to not to totally put my foot in my mouth Too much light for you guys are gonna get blinded. No, it's better like this, I think. Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to add more light, but it just washed away everything. Someone says it's actually amazing that you're doing this with single chisel. Uh, you know, it's like I actually I'm such I'm I'm not a tools guy. I really don't. I'm not a big tools guy. I'm not a very uh, practical person, which which might surprise people. You know, it's like I can't. I'm not good at construction. I'm not good at at uh, you know renovation and all the kind of stuff guys do. I'm, I don't understand cars. Um, and so because of that, I, I never, I just kind of do with what I have. And I, and I rarely do I spend a lot of time thinking of how I could do it in a better way, like how I could make it and uh, save time or have a better tool or have the right tool. Or So I just kind of, if I can do it with whatever tool I have in my hand, um, then I'll just go ahead. And also like, I'm, I'm not systematic. And so... Sometimes I'll do the same thing with a different tool, and it's only after I'm done that I realize that I've done that. So Patrick Morrison asks, where I get my references for my carvings. Um, and so it's a mix of uh, of places. I think I talked about it a little bit a little earlier. I I mostly base my work, like, let's say the there's these really high carvings that were done in the 10th, 11th century after iconoclasm. They're ivories. They're sometimes called the Romanos ivories. Um, 
And so there's a whole tradition of of ivories which came about after iconoclasm. And I would say that those are really like for an icon carver, they're the place to look because that's where the language got really developed. There are certain things earlier than that, but after iconoclasm is when really, you know, I would say everything we we understand of icons uh, really really took shape. And so those are my go-to. Like those are the those are my basic uh, reference points. But then uh, I also look at. Obviously, later ivories, but also Western, Western medieval carving, and so let's say the cathedrals, the uh, the the cathedrals in France, the uh, late Romanesque, early Gothic cathedrals, and the late Romanesque, early uh, Gothic ivories, in terms of uh, in terms of style. And uh, and so that's mostly where I get my my influence, or what, where I look to to how to interpret. So because because icon painting in a way is a marginal art in the church in the Orthodox Church, then for sure it's it's influence. I influence my work is influenced by icon painting. Um, so one of the things that I felt that had happened is that icon painting had developed certain tropes that became pretty universal in terms of uh, in terms of, of iconography. Not 100% universal, but I would say pretty universal. <coughs> say a way of doing the eyes, a way of doing the, 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 the glance, the stare of the person in the icons. We kind of recognize the better icons as having certain, certain ways of doing eyes and, and um, hands and all this stuff. Whereas in carving, it felt like it was all over the place. And a lot of those better tropes didn't develop because it was marginal and because, you know, ivory carving basically almost stopped after uh, Constantinople fell. Um, and so I also tried to adapt some of the better aspects of icon painting to carving. So that's been one of my, one of my goals or one of my... How can I say this? Like one of the things that motivates what I'm doing is to take is to is to take some of the better developments in icon painting and adapt them to carving. Because there's some things you can't do in a carving. So it's it's like I'm not the only person who does that. I would say most icon carvers will use uh, uh, will use paintings, icon paintings as some as their models, but a lot of them don't think it through, and so. One of the things that, like I said, those early ivories, the like 11th, 10th, 11th century ivories, they give you like a basic map and then you can use those as a ground on which to build to then uh, adapt it to new, to new um, ways of, of uh, based on the painting. So one of the things I feel like was never really well done in, in Eastern, in Eastern iconographic tradition in terms of carving was I feel like the faces are always are are not great like they're they're kind of mediocre uh and they were more successful in kind of western medieval art let's say like late romanesque art the way they did the eyes in a very kind of simple stylistic way and um and so i tend to i tend so what i did is i looked at those and then joined them with a more byzantine clothing and byzantine um proportions I would say, and just iconology. So Deluxe says, I sent a message you a DM on Twitter, unless there's a different way uh, you would like to be contacted. Uh, I mean, I, I can check. I don't like, I don't always see all the DMs because some of them are, some of them are, if, if you're not, if I don't follow you, then they kind of go into spam or whatever it's called or message request or whatever. Uh, so I don't always see them, and I don't always answer. I'm sorry, I, I was, especially since the Jordan Peterson interview. I've been really overwhelmed by messages, and it's it's very touching because a, a lot of people are writing me really wonderful messages, but I I just can't I just can't answer everybody. Um, and also, like a lot of people are asking me to go on their podcasts, and 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 I understand. Like I I sympathize, but it's hard because those take up a lot of time. 
and you know and, and also because everybody has a podcast like i i I have a podcast, so it's not. I'm not complaining about that. But everybody has a podcast, so it's hard to, it's hard to, to. Yeah, it's hard to answer those messages in the positive. Let's say, but I'll, I can check your message and see what you say. So you can really see. I mean, think you can really see the face. Kind of appearing pretty clearly. You know, it's coming along. And so, next step is going to be the eyes. You can see I basically carved the eye socket first to give myself some shape. So it's it's shaping the eye automatically. Then I can fiddle with it later, but What says do icon NFTs? Why would I need to do icon NFTs if I have a physical object that I can just sell? I'm not sure how that would be. 
Like, how, how would that even work? Someone says, any advice for an aspiring iconographer? I have a chance to take some lessons under an iconographer at St. Anthony Monastery. Should I seek a blessing? Uh, I mean... I would say it's, it's always useful to have a blessing for what you're doing. Uh, like I said, I don't think you actually need the per, like a permission of your priest to learn to 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 paint icons if you're interested in it. Uh, it's probably a good idea to talk about it with your spiritual father. But for sure, if you're going to be making icons for the church or making them like besides just practicing and learning, making them for veneration, then I would suggest that you be a little more deliberate about that and maybe, in fact, do, uh, you know, ask a blessing of your priest or of your bishop. Um, So my advice to you is to practice. That's the advice you could give a give an artist. I would say my advice to most iconographers is is uh, learn to draw. Like really learn to draw because people get caught up in the technical part of icon painting and they they get caught up in the idea because you can trace a pattern like and so because of that a lot of iconographers don't learn to to draw properly. And uh, it's like, I don't care how good your pattern is. If you don't know how to draw, I can tell in your icon. And because there's a, there's like a, there's an uneasiness about, there's, I don't know how to explain it. It's like when you paint, when you know how to, um, and so I really suggest that people should learn to draw. And when I mean draw, I don't mean even just draw icons. I mean, learn to draw, learn, learn how to, how, and, and so now it's learning all kinds of even, Learning to draw from nature, uh, you know, learning to to uh, learning proportions, learning to draw, uh, you know, from uh, like how to do illustrations, you know, how to draw hands, how to draw feet, how to draw. All of that is something which will be useful to you. And to be honest, like that is really what will always separate the real, like kind of more professional iconographer from the amateur is, uh, is a capacity to draw. Another advice too, is I would say, if you're learning to paint icons, uh, be careful, like be careful because You'll often have people who don't, let's say, have a sensitivity to quality. Will if they hear that you're you're painting icons, will right away say, "Well, can you paint an icon for me? Like, can you paint can you paint an icon for a church? Because they want cheap. Like, they don't like paying for for art." Uh, and so, I would say, be very wary of that because just because you took one icon painting class or two or three doesn't mean that you you can paint the level of icons that should be in a church. And, and uh, you know, it, I think that kind of amateur spirit explains a lot of the bad, bad icons that we find in churches being used and being, being part of the, being the, actually part of the liturgy. It's because people kind of improvise themselves. Someone said three hundred dollars too cheap. You know, it's a it's a tricky thing the icon the icon uh, world because you you're making objects for people to use in their prayer life, and so yeah, I'm not making icons. Um, I'm not making images just for consumption or fan art or you know whatever or for a gallery, and so I have to be I have to be like attentive to that and, and be careful about that and you know it's weird because i always kind of said that i try to make my but it's like i can make i i've made icons that are ten thousand dollars like that take forever and take months and like i'm willing to to, to charge for really expensive time consuming and, and and difficult icons but i think it's important 
that these little icons have a have a kind of reasonable price because because yeah because it's you know everybody needs icons to pray with so it's like I'm at I'm as touched to know that someone you know someone who has a you know a little job and or two jobs and is you know struggling in life will nonetheless like put a little bit of money aside to be able to buy a real icon instead of getting a print and have that kind of just be part of their life to me that's really touching so um so I want to try to keep something accessible for for anybody and you know in the end in the end God has blessed me like in so many ways like you know so I have nothing to complain. Like I'm, I'm fine. You know, like I'm totally fine. So someone asked if I use gold leaf. I do, but not always. So I, if if a, if a client wants gold leaf, I can use it. But I don't. It's not systematic. So if if it's a, it's like an extra step, and it's a it's a pretty for stone. It's a time it's a time consuming step. It'll take uh it'll take me like a few hours to put on the. Or at least an hour, an hour and something to 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 add the um, to add the gold. If you go to my website, you'll see you'll see um, examples with gold in them. On them. All right. So as you can see, it's it's. I mean, it's coming along pretty nicely. It's almost. It's almost. It's, not almost done, but at least the, uh, the 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 basic work is almost done. There's always some fiddling to do in the end to make it really nice. But I would say you can enough that you can really see the the face. Okay. She probably heard me speak French to my wife there. Because my workshop is like right behind my, right behind my, uh, my house. And it's my son's birthday today. 16. He's 16. And so... My wife was like, because we, we actually celebrated his birthday during the weekend, but she's like, we should still do something, you know, a little something special for him. And I agree. I have to figure that out. It's been really tough for the kids on with COVID. Is it turning 16 and, you know, it's really hard to see your friends and everybody's nervous. And it's actually technically like the kids aren't allowed. Nobody's allowed to go in anybody's house here so it's just been very frustrating
Alright, well, let's do the nose. Sorry for that sound. It gets it makes a really weird sound. So someone asks, uh, Max Hydery asks, think for all the content, which version of the Bible should I read? Does it matter? I personally prefer the King James. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the King James myself just because I grew up with it and, you know, I'm just used to the formulation. Um, and so I don't really, I would say it's best to avoid those Bibles that are too technical um, in the sense of... Uh, that have all the footnotes and all that stuff in terms of scholarly opinion about text. And I, I really dislike those Bibles. Um, and so I would say King James is, is fine with me. A lot of people would say that at least for the Old Testament, you should read this, the, the 70, the Septuagint. But, you know, you can get the Orthodox Study Bible, which is good. But we're kind of we're kind of we're ruined in a way now because you know when I'm reading let's say I'm reading scripture in terms of uh, studying scripture then I always read like different versions of the same verse and then you know go on Bible Hub and then check out the the interlinear version and and so it's it's we're pretty we're actually pretty lucky to be able to do that and so we're it's we're less in danger of, of giving in to uh, kind of propaganda that can be in translations. But if you listen to um, the the Lord of Spirits podcast, like you'll hear Father Stephen complain all the time about how most Bible translations have have a have like an agenda and in the sense they, they have had the agenda of of evacuating scripture of all the weird stuff, all the stuff that were, was problematic for people, um, kind of cleaning up scripture, making it look uh, decent. But uh, but that's not a that's not necessarily a good thing, because a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, the a lot of the the mysteries are in the weird stuff. You know, a lot of the pearls are hidden in there. So someone says to they recommend the drawing uh, course by Julia Hayes. Yes, definitely. Julia has a has a Patreon project, which I think it's like a monthly. You pay like five dollars a month or ten dollars a month for however time you want to to do it, and she 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 gives all these drawing classes, and she does uh, like daily exercises, and she's really good. Like she really knows how to draw. She learned to draw from George Cordes. Uh, who is probably one of the best draft people, like one of the best draftsmen in terms of icons today. And so she, she she's quite good. She can really teach people the the kind of logic, the inner logic of icons. I'm going to destroy your ears with that. Sorry. All right.
one says it's hilarious the violent vacuuming to the face it's not violent you have to understand it as purifying i'm purifying the, the surface <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll do the nostril. So in the face, I tend to do the the pupils or the irises towards the end, the inside of the eye. At least the end of the face. So I don't know of someone asked this already, but what what are your thoughts on that NFT that sold six nine million dollars? I have not see, I haven't followed that at all, so I don't know. Well, I don't even know what is it a what is the NFT of? It's a, is it an image? What is it? It's a song or? I mean, I, I, it's like I guess people are just wanting to be, to be like right. Just right in there, they want to be in the new thing. They want to be in the new thing. They see it as the future. All right, so now the eyes are the trickiest thing. Someone asked if I'm the first person to venerate all my icons. You know, it's a it's a tricky thing, the whole venerating your own icons. You know, I have an icon that I carved towards the beginning of my of my carving practice from from the early days, and I kept it. Uh, and I use it sometimes, like I use it for for uh, for during prayer. Like we put it up uh, while we're doing morning prayers and stuff. But it's always a little awkward because it's hard to look at your own work and not be looking at it technically. Uh, and so and so it's a tricky thing for me to venerate my my own icons. I'm not saying it is impossible, but it, it just I don't know. So this is the only part where I'm going to re redraw. 
because the eyes are yeah that's very good So the wakeful asks, do you think the newness of Canada makes your conversion to orthodoxy more possible? In Europe, it feels like the weight of history makes it difficult. Um, it's possible. Maybe the spirit of like North America, you know, the, there's a reason why um, in North America is where a lot of the, the, the first like translating into English happen or translating into other languages but there are other places where like for example in russia there was a moment where there were there were a nice amount of converts in uh in in france paris for example so it just depends where you are the thing is that if you're if you're in a place where the the ethnic group that brought orthodoxy has only been there for a short time very short time then you're going to you're going to have a problem you're going to have the problem of uh of a kind of ethnicism and you'll have the problem of not having liturgies in 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 english in your language and them also not understanding why you would want to become orthodox in the first place whereas in america you know the russian emigres uh you know ended up having a kind of more evangelical spirit you could say and in the the generations with which came after the 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 first waves of russian immigrant emigres after the revolution there's enough time for them to kind of assimilate to to french and english culture to kind of develop uh to want to translate and to develop a version of orthodoxy which could be understood by by westerners so All right, so we have the iris. I'm actually going to use a exacto knife for this. Let me get into the little little details. My face in front of the camera. No. I don't like to talk to talk while I'm doing the the pupils because that's for sure a place where I don't want to mess up.
I also have these smaller tools that I use for uh, doing detail stuff. I have a whole, like I have also have a whole set of tools that I use for like actual miniatures. So then there's some fixing to do. And her eyelid is too low actually. <clears throat> you know when the uh, eyelid is too low and the character, the person looks sleepy. <laughs> So you want to avoid that sleepy look. So Mike says, since you're backlog with orders, what other iconographers would you recommend to look at? Uh, depends. What do you mean by carving or do you mean... Um, just icon painting, carving. There are a few out there. Um, there's um, one of my students, Ron Slockett. You can look him up. He's on social media. He's been getting better. Like he's he's been uh, he's been doing pretty well. Um, there's 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 someone is like who kind of taught me some carving. His name is George Belak. I don't know if he still carves though. Um, there's uh there's a there's a Greek iconographer who's amazing doing ivory and bone carving. His name, his name is Michael Lucas, L-O-U-K-A-S, written in Greek, though. Um, and you can order stuff from, from him from Greece. Like, he'll, he'll make it for you. Um, there's also someone, oh, man, his name escapes me right now. He's going to hate me for not remembering his name. Uh, one of Aiden Hart's uh, students is really good. If you go on my Facebook feed and you scroll down, you'll find I posted a I posted a an image of uh, of his uh, his visit visit of the magi 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 um, visitation not visitation but the, the the visit of the magi to the mother of God after she she gave birth and his carvings are really really good. Aiden Hart is a really good carver, but I'm sure he's probably as busy as I am. He was carving before I was like long before I was. Um, there's also, there are a few other people who kind of caught me off guard <laughs> and now I don't remember people's names and, and, uh, I feel bad because they'll think it's because I don't like them, but it's not the case. Um, so Michael Boomer asked, do you have an apprentice, somebody apprenticing with you? Um, actually, no, I, I just have my assistant. It's hard to have someone apprenticing with you with COVID and everything, especially now. Uh, like I couldn't have them stay here or anything, so it's just not practical. So my assistant has his own workshop, and uh, and I'll visit him, or he'll come here uh, when we need to see each other, and to trade off carvings or to talk about the, the next projects. In a simpler world, like I, I'd be happy to have uh, people. So Scott Elias says, hey, Jonathan, I had the four evangelists from you from your last carving sales. Our family loves them. It's really cool to see your process in action. That's awesome. You got the four. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I'm happy you have them. 
It's nice to know that they're all in the same place too. That's pretty cool. All right, so you're starting to really, I mean, the face is pretty much done. I'll, all I need, I need to do to make the ears. And the ears, I, I do, I just have a very simple shape. I don't make the ears elaborate at all. just to suggest all right so let's look at this Need to make sure that all my uh, that all these these lines are gone. Suggest this fold here, just so that it's not too boring. Same here. I suggest these folds. So I also need to create the band because she has a band around her veil. Someone says, don't breathe in the dust. Yeah, that's my sin. When I get into little details, I really struggle because I blow on the dust to make it go away. Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm I'm not good at. Especially when it's like just a little bit of dust and I just kind of blow on it. It's horrible. It's like the worst thing ever. It's it's like gypsum silica silica dust.
So I'm just, one of the important things, one, one of the things that makes a carving look very uh, subtle is, is like you don't have just lines, you have changes of level. And so, so I carved the line to make the band uh, appear. I'm not just leaving it as a line. I'm actually, I'm actually making sure that the band is on top of the clothing. Add this guy in here. Need to put in some subtle eyebrows. So eyebrows are a big question because if you look at ancient ancient carving, like even a lot of ancient um, ivory carvings, uh, they don't have eyebrows. And uh, and so once once Aiden Hart, who's a, who I respect and admire, like he's an amazing artist, uh, iconographer, wrote me and said, "You shouldn't you shouldn't carve eyebrows. You should you should just leave it. You know because ancient ancient carvings have uh, don't have eyebrows." And uh, and I thought about it and uh, I decided that I'm going to continue to carve eyebrows because the reason I think that ancient carvings didn't have eyebrows is because they were um they were painted like even the carved the carved um the carved icons were were most often painted in color and so then they would have put the eyebrows in color but because i don't because mine aren't then i decided to put eyebrows Didn't, someone said, didn't know the Mona Lisa was an icon because she doesn't have eyebrows. That's funny.
So one of the one of the things is that when I cut with a knife, let's say, I need to go back because it's it gets kind of um, it's kind of crunchy on the edges that I carved for the first time. I don't know what other word to use. All right, I'll leave the band here. So someone asked if I pray before carving. Uh, yes, um, I pray. I have morning prayers. I don't necessarily have like I. So some iconographers they have something. It's a late. It's a late thing, which but it's fine. There's this something called the iconographer's prayer, and so you can find it online if you're interested. And then some people, you know, when they actually go into the workshop, then they'll they'll pray that particular prayer. So now, last step, actually, pretty much, is going to be the star. The star is a um, and so Euro DV ask, are there any particular iconographer saints you have an affinity towards? I mean, I think for sure Saint Andre. I mean, it's hard not to. He's so like his icons are so amazing and so mystical. So for sure, Saint Andrei Rublev. Um, I mean, Saint Theodore the Studite is important just because he was really, I mean, I don't know if he's an iconographer, he's not really an iconographer, he's more like a defender of icons. Um, so I learned, I, I, I didn't, I guess I didn't know, but it, it, I've heard that Saint Paisios of the Holy Mountain who died in the 90s was, a, was carving icons. Um, and so it's pretty awesome. I'd love to see his icons. All right, so. It's going to be carved though, almost like a chip carving. I don't know if you guys know what chip carving is, but I carve one side on like this, and then I'm going to carve the other side. The camera was about to fall there. Sorry, guys. Sorry for the shakiness here.
Two months I've carved one side, then I carved the other. So Michael Bomert says, seeing the Theotokos gradually appear has been quite moving for me. Thank you for doing this live today. Well, you know, it's my pleasure. I'm really happy to be able to do this. I'm always kind of looking for ways to, to show that I really appreciate the opportunity all of you guys are giving me to talk about symbolism, to to have a, a, a kind of public voice. And uh, it's all because of, of you guys. And I really appreciate it. So we'll see. If people like this, then uh, I'll be happy to do it again. If people appreciate this. Not too much, because... I get the sense that streaming... Like, people who stream every day, like, God bless them and everything, but... I always feel like it, it's it's probably dangerous to stream every day just because you're definitely going to end up saying something stupid that you'll regret if you just leave the camera on in Babylon for hours and hours. You know, it's like asking for trouble. So last little thing is going to be the stripes on her veil. She has these uh, these bands on her inner veil. Someone says, I hope he doesn't delete. I will not, I won't delete it. I'll leave up this, I'll leave this video up. It would be part of our, part of the 100,000 celebration. <laughs> Someone says Orthodox Bob Ross. <laughs> Man. I mean, all of a sudden I was gonna like start imitating him. We should have been highly inappropriate.
so it's basically there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm definitely going to go back and uh, fiddle and uh, fix a few things. Also, it's it's always a good idea to usually to leave some time because you you end up not seeing certain things if you spend too much time on one carving. At least that's my experience. Well, that's pretty much it. The last thing that I would I could do is I would put the inscription and then I would sand I would sand a few parts like the parts that are that are messy. For example, if you look at the the halo, it still has some marks in there. So that's kind of easy to take off with some sandpaper and these pencil marks and stuff, little little things like that. But it's pretty much pretty much done. And so I think I'm going to uh, going to stop the stream now. Um, so yeah, thanks guys for tuning in. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. I liked it. And so maybe I'll do it again at some point. I have to think about it. And uh, and so thanks again. Like I said, thanks for the attention. Thanks for the support, everybody. I really appreciate it. And so uh, and so uh, see you guys very soon. Bye bye. I don't even know how to stop this. There you go.